Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of Finding Light with me, Brad Carr. Today, the tables have turned and I find myself on the receiving end of some grilling questions from my friend and fellow photographer, Eugene Tehran. You might recognize Eugene from the first episode that I recorded uh, where I interviewed somebody and that was him. We sat in the Shropshire Hills and I posed a lot of questions to him. So today it's revenge for Eugene and he gets to go deep into my mindset, deep into my life, deep into my childhood, my teenage years and everything that really has led me up to this point where I'm creating photographs and even writing stories and essays for the world. So if you want to get to know a little bit more about me, in fact, a lot about me, because I've aired things to Eugene and to you guys in this episode that I haven't really spoken to many people about before. So it's very open. I'm being incredibly vulnerable and sharing a lot about myself. So I hope that you sit back and enjoy this episode. Um, and yeah, do please let me know what you think uh, there's the comment section open on Spotify and YouTube so you know post some questions if, if you want or you know just get ready to engage in some further conversation I'm happy to reply to comments and messages so yeah if anything springs to mind then fire it my way for now I'll be quiet and I'll let you dive into the interview so thank you welcome to uh, Brad's podcast uh, finding light your podcast today. My podcast today. <laughs> so uh, you may recognise my face from the first interview Brad did. So I'm Eugene Teron, and today it's my turn to interview Brad. Yeah. So uh, hopefully you get to know him a little bit better. So for uh, we're here on we're on we're doing an on location podcast as well this time as well, aren't we? Yeah. It's Same as last time. But so we're it was last, last time, but we're in we're indoors. Yeah, it's pouring with rain outside. Yeah. But um, we're here, sat amongst Brad's photos. Yeah. Um, at a, at the uh, at at his ga- at the gallery in there. Uh, the old Bell. The old Bell Gallery in Montgomery. Mm-hmm. Montgomery, so Montgomery Town in Midway. Um, it's pretty special, you know, coming in here and seeing all these pictures out, hanging up on the wall, and you know, it's really nice to see everything in print and just hanging and lit and. It's pretty good, isn't it? It is a great feeling and different to how we normally see photos in this day and age. Definitely. Lot of awesome. screen. This is how things should be. Double tap on Instagram. Yeah, yeah double tap and move on to the next one. Exactly. Yeah, so, so. yeah, this is different, you know, being immersed in, in my own work, it's mine, I see it every day, but I guess maybe from your perspective, walking in here adds a new feel to it. Yeah, it's got a new feel. It's nice to come here and see it and, you know, support you as a friend and, and as an artist and things like that. So, you know, I think that's all sort of adds to sort of uh, adds 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 to the good feeling that surrounds it, really. So, yeah. So, well, my first question was okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> hey, <it's fine. laughs> um, we've always, we we've talked before about how printing is the sort of culmination, I guess, of the, um, the photographic process. I mean, what does it mean to you to be sat here, surrounded by your photos in print? Um, mm. you know, what, what does that mean to you? What, how does that make you feel as a, as a, as an artist, as someone who's created all these all these pieces on the wall? Mm. Mm, great question. Um, it it's it, it it gives everything a focal point. Everything, not just in terms of you know my journey began creative journey photography spiritual journey whatever you call it five years ago but there's 32 years of my life that's led to this moment and all of the photos that are an accumulation of all of the experiences that I've been subjected to as I've lived many different lives so far in this one single little life but um to kind of see everything that has taken five years to produce or I mean a lot of these 2021 I guess most of these were were, were made in, in 2022 so it, it's all of those little moments that you know you go out on a morning you, you spend three four hours out you click a button and you come back but then to accumulate that all together into one small room and immerse yourself in it and, and kind of reflect on it and think 
back to all of those mornings when I've gone there with so much to unload and you know between between photo shoots there's probably a month sometimes and that's a month of life and a month of emotions and a month of things that need to be expressed so now I'm in amongst all of my releases my emotional releases if you like so it's kind of quite uh, quite humbling quite um, therapeutic in many ways as well to just be yeah, with it's, it. it's almost like you've distilled your life and your emotions and it, into this one room where you know you can come and see them on the wall people can come and see them on the wall yeah that's just sort of how, how I see it you know as an outsider looking looking at you and sorry looking at you and talking to you you know I, I, that's, that's what I see I see the emotions distilled mm. into pictures and put on the wall and you know, it's something you should be immensely proud of as well, which I imagine you are, so. Yeah, I, I am, of course. I, <laughs> I, I, I still know what work is left to do, so I, I, I don't tend to sit and feel too proud too often because I'm somebody who thinks I'm on, on to the next thing quite often. But, you know, when I do sit and think about it, it's definitely... I'm, I'm proud, of course, of myself because I remember myself at different stages of my life not being so confident to express and inside there was always this frustration in many ways that I couldn't and I didn't have the ability to express what I wanted to express. So, you know, to think about how far I've come on my own photographic journey, but in my mind I call it more of a healing journey and you know these are the representations of that. So for then people to walk through the door and and almost when because I, I don't walk over to people straight away when they come into sure, sure. my exhibition. I like to sit sometimes and just observe them. And you know you see facial expressions and you kind of see this sense of they're taking people to maybe the the not that they're conscious of it, but maybe to the place that I've psychologically been to in all of these moments as well so it's like people can receive some healing from them as well which yeah that's something i think is to be proud of more so than the you know definitely i mean pride comes in different ways it comes in sorry different forms rather than different ways yeah I mean, it's, it's it's not necessarily not necessarily always the feeling of it you know i'm proud of this way it could yeah. be the way that other people perceive it as well so you know, yeah I, completely hear what you're saying yeah. and appreciate it. And I, and I try to, um, quite often I think we can get too caught up in this idea that I've done this, I, I, you know, like the ego would, the ego loves to claim responsibility and, and um, you know, take the credibility for doing this. And there is still that little part of me that is like, yes, I, I've done this, but of course I, look outside of that at the you know I'm just this avatar that whatever is controlling and, and guiding towards whatever needs to be done through me if that makes sense and if I maybe explain a little bit about what I mean by that because I don't believe that you know that the ego is necessarily a bad thing and we should eradicate ego the ego in life is essential it's our um, it's the, it's the avatar, it's what humans perceive me as, the identity, right? But what I feel like with a lot of my creativity, my creative works is, we've talked a little bit about this on our, on the episode when I interviewed you in the sense that, um, ah, oh, it'll come to me. In, in the sense that uh, nothing is truly original or my view on things were that nothing is truly original and that actually we're just tuned into everything on a daily basis and whatever is outside. So consciousness, the, the, you know, the, the consciousness of Earth, of Mother Earth, Mother Gaia. And my creativity, I believe, is just me being used for whatever sense whatever the, the, that needs, whatever this world needs at the moment. And I feel like it's healing based on what I've experienced. And so it's like I'm channeling this energy through myself to create, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. So there's the soul and the ego. 
Yeah, uh, if you look at, I mean, if you do look at these pictures of sort of picking up, and you were talking about healing, obviously, I do see a lot of sort of calmness, a lot of serenity in in the images, a lot of light, a lot of hope. You know, sort of mm. the way sort of I'm looking at the pictures that are sort of behind the cameras now that no one can see. But you know, there's a sort of dark in the foreground and the light in the background. You know, to me that signifies you know a sort of a dark and a light side maybe or maybe a pathway to hope or a pathway to healing or excuse me however you want to phrase it yeah and i think a lot of these images that are up in this room are very indicative of that i think that's a theme that's quite strong in all the work that you've created and the work that you present both you know on your website in print and on social media yeah yeah it's definitely something that is and, and it is now it probably wasn't a conscious uh, decision to include elements like that within my work but just I guess as it's evolved and as I've evolved and maybe posed some deeper thoughts to my art and to myself to life that has been consciously included in lots of my photographs but initially it's just what I was drawn to photograph was I'd naturally probably after about a year of, photograph of photographing I'd naturally gravitate to these scenes where I include some light behind. I'd, I'd backline one, two, three, four, five, six, I think six out of the nine in here all have that same theme where I'm shooting directly into the light, or shooting across the light. And there is that element of, you know, we're all, we're all blends of both, right? And photography is just the perfect representation of that philosophical concept. If we don't have the balance between the two, we don't have a photograph. We have a white photograph or a black photograph. Oh, exactly. But do you feel that some of that, some of the images that you've created here with the light and the the image that is, or some of your images in general, the, and the way you've arranged them with the light and, 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 you know, compositionally with trees, branches, darks, do you feel that some of that is, you know, a subconscious look into... Um, a subconscious in, look? Yeah, a subconscious look into yourself because, uh, you know, sometimes we create subconsciously as well. Yeah. I think a lot of creation does come. So, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. I think a lot of creation, creative work is made subconsciously. Yeah. And the emotion that goes into that is. Uh, I've got a bit more of a question uh, on that a little bit later, so I don't want to dwell on it too much okay. now. But uh, bear that in mind for a. Uh, yeah, basically. should I offer a little bit of something? Just I'd like you to offer a little bit of something. So. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, yeah, it's a lot of subconscious kind of drives in in my work, and I think particularly in scenes that I haven't necessarily been to scout too much. And me and Mark talked about this when I interviewed Mark actually, because he mentioned the same kind of principle that actually he's freer when he's not in his thinking mind. So if he goes to a location where he's already got his composition sorted, he's just waiting for the light. And there are a few in here that have that have had that process um, with them. And I think uh, once I've got those out of the way, there's one, two, three behind the camera there that were just impulsive. And I believe that those are the ones that are truest of us because they're where our senses are leading us to. You know that little tingle in your brain that yeah. sees the little bit of light? Yeah, and you go, ah, oh, yeah, Put Yeah. tripod camera. Yeah, yeah. and that you makes... follow it, and that's the, in, in my, you know, this <laughs> idea of ego versus soul, that to me is my soul, that's my, you know, that's my child, that's my me in my purest form when this has stopped, and I rely on this, and I rely on, on, the, on, on everything that I see and feel and smell, and I think, you know, that's, that's pure creativity in my mind. I, I agree completely. I mean, I, I can only, you know, refer to some of my own images here, but some of the, my favourite images and some, maybe some of the best images, you know, subjectively that I've created yeah. are the ones where it's an, an, an impulse. It's something I've seen or felt or, yeah. you, you know, I've looked across it looked across at some light or looked across yeah. at a mountain and thought, wow, oh, you know, you know, you just feel this, yes. like this release and, you just go, and it just happens, <clears throat> you know, the, the photo yeah. just happens. And if somebody turned around to you and said to you, Eugene Bright, 
Why did you take that photo? And you go, I don't know, right. actually, in the moment. I don't, I don't know. know. But you maybe you can maybe think about it when you get home. Absolutely. So. Silent Waters behind there, that's another one. So it was pure... Uh, <laughs> Recording. <Yeah, that's, laughs> Sorry, carry on. Silent Waters. So, yeah, that's another one that was pure impulse. And that actually inspired a full essay on my website. I don't know if you've read it. Seeking Stillness. I've not read it. Not read that one. Okay. I, I actually mm -hmm. deliberately tried to not read oh. anything that you'd done before I wrote the... Ah. Um, questions for this interview because um, I didn't want to be influenced by, you know, your thoughts or ah. uh, or anything like that. Okay. So all the questions that I've devised and derived are from my own uh, from my own mind and yeah. I guess obviously they're from my own mind. Yeah. But um, just from knowing you and seeing your work and. Uh, and that's what I thought that would be. Uh, yeah. But no, I've not actually. But anyway. I do advise people to go and read these <laughs> articles. <laughs> Becoming nature, seeking still. Becoming nature, that's, seeking that's all visited. And achieving catharsis Links through below, nature yeah. photography. Link yeah, I'll link them. Uh, but drawing back to uh, Silent Waters, yeah, that was one that was uh, was in, had heavily inspired that piece of writing actually, and that was a real. Um, insight actually into my own mind because I realised that actually we can create a photograph on, on a morning, but the essay actually took probably a year to formulate and come out of my mind. It was only upon further reflection and you know articulation that I managed to piece together that, that written piece of work and reflect upon why I was maybe drawn to take that one in a series of three or four other photographs. So, yeah, so do you feel that's a sort of natural part of the curation process of sort of uh producing an image or producing a collection of images, you know, is, 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 you know, taking the photo and then, you know, sitting back and when you see them on your computer screen or in print or whatever, and then you sort of, you put meaning to it. I, yeah. think, I, I think that's quite, from, for me, I th certainly think that's quite an important part of the process and, and certainly sort of where I draw a lot of meaning from my photos. And it sounds like from what you're saying that is the same for you. Yeah, with that <coughs> shadow of a doubt. Um, I think, of course, during the editing process, and then, of course, the, the upload to social media process. When and I love to write with, alongside, as you do, alongside my photographs with a caption. Sometimes the captions will maybe inspire something in me, so they're just a a piece of writing that I'll come up with in the moment, and then I may look at something on that piece of writing and think, okay, maybe that needs some further investigation, <laughs> and, or maybe not, or maybe I just bin it and let people double tap and move along, but. Silent Waters is one that I kept coming back to time and time again and I, l I kind of kept looking at that photograph just thinking that's speaking to me, that's, you know, it's a piece of work that I've produced from somewhere within or without. <laughs> Why is it speaking to me in this way? What's it trying to say to me? And I do think that every, pretty much every photograph, certainly everyone in, in the room speaks to me in a different way and maybe says something different. Whether I know it yet or not, there's certainly one over there, which is the two trees, life and death, I, uh, that I haven't, quite, other one. I haven't quite figured out maybe the depths of its meaning, and I think it's one that will probably always evolve as I learn a lot more, especially about psychology and, yeah. and philosophy, because that speaks, speaks to me on many levels already. So, yeah. yeah, it's certainly an interesting, it's an interesting image to look at and sort of, you know, to think about it in that way, and I, I think, like you say, it will evolve over time as you evolve as a person. Yeah. Your soul evolves, and your thoughts evolve, and your um, processes evolve. Even I think it will probably take on different yeah. meanings. If you looked at it again in ten years' time, you'd probably say, "Yeah, to, yeah, you do that means something completely out." Yeah. Way, so. And I may look at it and think, "Yeah, what the hell was I thinking of that one?" <laughs> but I think alongside my favorite photo is the "What was that?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I got a lot. Why did I do that? Why did, yeah. I, why did I click the button then? But yeah. like you oh, say, well. there's reasons why we do it certain things yeah. at certain times. So go, going back, taking a few steps back slightly, um, you, we've talked about you know having all these photos on the wall and and you know this, you know being proud and the ego and stuff like that. How do you take and how do you interpret people's in, people's interpretations of your images and? How do you interact act, act with them when they sort of, excuse me, actively comment on them or actively critique an image or offer feedback for that matter? And um, I know we touched on this briefly with the lady who was in here last time. Uh, 
But I, I want I, I sort of I'm trying to get a better understanding of how other people's um, interpretations of your work uh, affect you. Well, not negatively necessarily, it could be in a positive way. And you know, how do you interact with them when they discuss yeah. your work in a way that may be different to the way you think about it? Yeah. Well, anything that comes out of somebody else's mouth is m generally more of a reflection of themselves than it is about me or my work. And I'm somebody that loves to learn from every single person I ever meet, whether they're saying something positive or negative. And maybe I'm not necessarily learning something about me or taking their words on and allowing them to sink in here and become a part of me, but I'm actually listening to what they're saying and trying to read between the lines as to actually what, that's, what they're telling me about themselves. Yeah. So of course there are moments when somebody that I respect in the photography world or, or any like an artist, you know, people, a harp player that I've met recently has made a, a comment on my work, and he grew up around a lot of really influential pieces of art in France or Switzerland in the Alps. He grew up around I think it was like Rembrandt's and another painter that he mentioned, which I can't remember, but words from him about my work and how it made him feel, they meant something, right? Because that's a respected opinion in a similar way to some of my peers as photographers. I listen more so as a reflection of my, my work when they make comment and I greatly appreciate their comments. And, and my opinion of Silent Waters actually uh, was definitely strengthened when it received a couple of comments from certain photographers who I'd respected for a long time and I thought okay maybe there are legs in terms of the photographic quality of this piece of work as well as what it meant to me emotionally yeah so I think I'm always kind of trying to gauge whether somebody's opinion is actually worth me opening up and letting it in or whether I need to just kind of draw a line and think is this person saying something negative as a, a, a an ulterior just, just to be cantankerous. It's, yeah, uh, it's such. absolutely. But those comments actually can, as we learned last time you were here, those kinds of comments when somebody voiced the fact that they didn't like a piece, it's actually not here today, uh, but it made her feel depressed. And, and, and that's a perfect example of the fact that that's not a reflection of the piece of work, it's a reflection of herself, right? Yes, and her connection. And her, her connection with yeah, the work. Her emotional state. And yeah. Amongst other things. That's not for me then to go home and think, tear it all down off the wall and say, oh my god, my work's crap. <laughs> it makes people feel depressed. and Because somebody else could walk in the, and, and somebody did actually, that's why it's not here, because somebody bought it. That Indeed. That's, I was just going to exhibition. say, didn't somebody later come along and buy that image? Yeah. Me, so. And they saw the footpath and the, the golden light and the darker foreground and it took them on their own little journey through and they thought, this is beautiful, I'm buying it. And, great. Yeah, it's amazing. It, I think that's quite amazing how you can have two different people, yeah. you know, walk, walk through that door over there and, you know, look yeah. at something in a completely different yeah. way. and. Without it being without it being a reflection on yourself, yeah. Day. And I don't think anybody who comes in here and you know positively or negatively comments uh, on any of your images, mm. you know, I don't think it's a reflection of you or no. your art. It is. It is their personal uh, interpretation of it. Yeah, sure. Or like that. And I'm making work from here, from inside of myself, in my heart. So I'm not gonna let too many people will influence that because I'm make, I'm creating images that represent my truth and what I believe to be representations of myself. That's fantastic. What's well, exactly what we should be doing. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, and that's the journey we're along to try to get to, right? Indeed. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I look at my own stuff and you know, people like it, they like it, people like it, they don't. I mean, you can't please everyone in no. the world. I think and I think the point... To put a, a bit of a blunt point on it, but, you know, yeah. and everyone's different. What difference would we be making? Would be people pleasing if we were to please everybody? I think the point of anything is to divide <laughs> opinions. Hopefully, fifty-one percent of people like them, yeah. forty-nine percent don't. You know, <laughs> so it's preferential. <laughs> anyway, moving along. So, um, 
I, I think as I've, I, I've mentioned already and we've talked about it quite a lot, um, so there's so much, there's so much emotions on this, on the wall in here. Um, and you know, I've said to regards to me as a person over the last few years, so you can use the camera focusing on you here, not me trying to read my question. <laughs> um, I wanted to discuss an image I saw of yours on Instagram. Uh, it's an image of a woodland, funnily enough. Uh, it's uh, you know, you'll put it on the screen for everyone yeah. to see, so people can see what we're talking about. But it's got two very distinct sides to it. It's um, I did send it to you last night to you. Know, yeah, you I know the image you were talking. <laughs> I was going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> it's got on one side on the on the sort of left hand side of the image to. To me, as I look at it, you know, it's quite dark. It's, it's deep woodland on the on the right hand side of the image. It it comes into light a little bit more. Mm. Um, I wanted to know if you felt that if that image was you know reflective of the different sides of your emotions, or is it or is it rep more representative of, representative of a transition that you're going through in your own mm. life or your own photography? Um, I just wondered if you could. Uh, I don't know if you thought about it in that way. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I thought quite deeply about that series. And you know, it, it, it's an image that um, I think that maybe is wise if I give a little perspective on it from my side. You yeah, know, I, I, I saw that. I saw that image, and I saw you know a sort of fifty-fifty split in, in the image of dark and light. And you know, I've had my own troubles that we discussed in, in, in my podcast, and you know. For me, looking at that image, I, I can see two sides, two sides of myself, mm. maybe two sides of you as well. And I just wanted you to elaborate on, you know, the, the way the photo is arranged and, yeah. and how that is reflective of your life and emotions, yeah. if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a deep uh, point to try to articulate, so you may have to just keep, keep digging a little bit yeah, with this one. <laughs> And uh, just allow me to uh, go where it needs to go, and uh, you know, I'll elaborate on it. Help you along the way if I can. Yeah. So I actually wrote a, another piece that I'm going to plug now. Uh, it's called Achieving Catharsis Through Nature Photography, and it was based on the whole series of photographs from that morning that that all had this theme of they have this kind of side to them and the way that I shot them of course is this light transitioning generally across across the scene uh, particularly in the one photograph that you mentioned uh, so it was a period of my life I hadn't created any work for maybe three months it was just coming to the end of summer so the kind of colors had just started to change and we had some mist and of course that's any cue any photographer's cue to get out and, and to create so yeah, I went out and uh, I'd kind of been in one of those phases where I'm reflecting and I'm thinking, when's my creativity going to come back? And uh, I, was, I had this desperation in me to create something because my life's changed so much in the past year and I'd draw back to one instance where I actually photographed the same woodland in December last year and my life was at a very, very different place to where I'm at now and I was going through a lot of things emotionally and psychologically and I was reflecting on you know lots of events that year things that I'd hoped had worked out and they didn't and I, I had you know, disappointments as we all go through you know kind of I went there and I created this series of eight maybe nine images that just had this almost an emptiness to them and uh it was a winter landscape, of course, very bare. The trees were stripped bare and there was, there was fog and just this frost on the ground. And they were just very representative of exactly where I was in life at that time. So to then go back towards the end of summer, beginning of autumn, when my life this year has been filled with so much hope and new opportunities. Of course, my move away to the coast didn't work out, but I came back for a great reason. Um, and, you know, I have... I guess, new light to look forward to in my life. So I went there and kind of had this optimism that I was out there and I was creating work again after a couple of months where I've been empty on the creative uh, batteries. And uh, I, I actually didn't have any preconceptions of what I was going to photograph that 
morning because I was so out of touch with the place, I hadn't been there for a year, I couldn't remember any of my old compositions. So I was just very much acting on impulse and uh, yeah, six, seven, eight photographs. That was actually one of the final ones that I took, which right. is quite, quite symbolic. And it's the one that I looked at last in my editing pile and I didn't include it in the blog until I went back to it afterwards and I started to see different things in it, particularly in that strong, bold silver birch tree that I included in the foreground that I kind of saw parts of my self in upon reflection thinking that kind of represents a lot about myself and where I'm at in my life at the moment and that I have you know lots of light lots of things to look forward to I feel an inner strength in how I'm portraying lots of things that have been buried inside of myself for a long time in terms of the, the written work and some new photographs that hold more meaning I'm, I'm finding new avenues within me that I didn't know were there before so yeah, that photograph really, as well as the, the light and the, you know, the, the strong dark to light concept, which also actually represents many areas of my life, particularly childhood, which was a very dark period of my life. I grew up uh, around a lot of domestic abuse and violence. Uh, I had, well, my father was an alcoholic and I, did, I don't know him. So for three years of my life, I the formative years I was in a, a home that was very chaotic and and dangerous for a child to be sure, around sure. Um, and then my mum left him and ended up with another man who actually I think the the quote I wrote in my book was like out of the what's the out of the pot and into the cauldron or something like that there's a there's a saying uh, yeah, out, the fire, out, and into out the of the frying pan into the fire yeah. that's the one uh, so you know I just have these these very uh, vivid, like very dark memories from my youth really that kind of ingrained in who I am as a person now and only just really in the past four or five years have I begun to take stock of those events and accept them as what they are and this has been a representation of, of that journey. So that photograph certainly. So that photograph is in the way you're explaining it to me and my understanding of what you're saying, it, it, that it, it's more of a an evolution through life yeah. than a sort of evolution through a current situation, for argument's yeah. sake. Or, or that, even though it could be representative of that, but for you, that is a um, an evolution through your your own personal personal life of having you know problems with with, with your father when you were when you were growing up, yeah, becoming you know coming into adulthood and and then sort of evolving into the person you are sitting here talking to me. Yeah. So that's quite powerful in a lot of ways. Yeah, and so. I feel like you asking me that question actually has maybe actually just allowed me to open up a little bit about that and maybe come to a realisation within myself that, that the, the darker corner of that image is actually, I don't see a 50-50 split in that, in that photograph too much. There's, there's a, a lot of piercing light on the right hand side and that, that darker part is almost just out of reach. It's almost in the, in the background. It's almost a... It's sort of glimpses of light in the darkness as such. Yeah, but, the, but that's the part that, you know, we don't need to go back there because all of this is, is over here and this is my light now. Creativity, I think, is it's a beautiful way to take stock of that darker area where the blues and the, the darker parts of the, the, the woodland are lurking, but actually taking stock of all of that and using that for, for good, whatever good is, using it for a positive change, I think. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, yeah. so that's, that's one of the reasons I sort of, uh, I guess, lent into this question. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think it was to sort of, you know, to try and explore a little bit more behind Brad and you know <laughs> who he is and his part. You know, also, I'm not meaning to bring up any no, negative memories or anything like that. But you know, we it's interesting how we we, we both use photography to process emotions and process uh, uh, events that have happened in pain and pain. You know, suffering, feeling, suffering <laughs> as well. 
and it's I always find it fascinating. Fa <coughs> excuse me. I always find it fascinating. We're looking at your images or or, or other people's images in, in how they in how they sort of process and place light and dark within place light and dark and, and certain elements in the scene. And you know, I always think, you know, is that reflective of if, of that person's emotions or that person's um, being or, mm. or, 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 or whatever word you want to use to go in there. Um, and I find that fascinating. I think that, that's the fascinating thing about photography. You, you, see, you see it with painters to a certain extent, you know, are they using darker tone paints? Are yeah. they sort of painting these deep, dark, dark scenes that are sort of, you know, reminiscent of the time or reminiscent of feelings? And, yeah. Um, maybe sculptors as well were sort of, you know, moody, sort of maybe the face is angry or the face is contorted. Yeah. Maybe that's also a representation of a feeling yeah. uh, of, of the artist. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's beautiful. And, I, you know, going back to you apologising for asking if you've pried too much. No, I think that actually the it's, all, it's great, I think, releasing these things through art, but also the spoken word is, is I don't know the, the statistics, but probably a thousand times more healing than expressing things through through written or, or photographic measures or art. I think, you know, speaking about these things is healthy and I'd probably encourage anybody yes, <laughs> who, who doesn't normally uh, express things through through speaking or, you know, or creativity as well, of course, to actually go out and try it because this has been mm. it's been hugely influential in my my life and the version of me that is sat here today wouldn't exist without without talking and having these conversations part of the reason I set the podcast up really was to have more so it's quite funny that I'm there on the other end on the, the receiving end on the receiving so end of the grilling yeah well, I'm but uh, I'm really enjoying it so well, I have a follow up prime, okay prying question okay <laughs> I'm just going to take, take a drink take a drink hmm <laughs> Is your photography uh, going to become more representative of yourself as you as you develop as a person? Um, how do, how do you see that happening? Mm. I mean, do you? I don't see. I couldn't have foreseen any of these coming out of myself. So to think now, I mean, it's exciting to think about what may come through me in the future, but I can't see. It. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what I'm going to be drawn to in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And who knows, maybe it won't even be photography, maybe it will be something else. Who knows? I'm very open to whatever, you know. So, I haven't got a vision for, for what I want to achieve. I'd love to try some, ex try and experiment with some different forms of photography, but um, I don't know how that's going to look. But I definitely feel like how we see is completely a representation of how we feel and how I'm feeling within myself now, myself as, you know, soul, as I'm, I'm being true, I feel like in my life at the moment, that journey, as far as I can see, is only going to continue, so I'm only going to fall into deeper levels of self-awareness and self-growth and self-love and all of this stuff, so that's only going to equate in me seeing deeper things like doors in the landscape, I think. And, and seeing different, different things as well in the landscape. And maybe make, making those things representative of who you are. Yeah, I think so. I think that's definitely the way that it's going to be going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you, you, you talked a minute ago about, um, you know, you've been through a journey, you know, you went to such a good place and, you know, you're, you're coming through, you're moving, you travel the rest of us to, to the case, and you know, so now moving back, and you, you, you seem to be in a, in, in a, a much better place on your, on your, in your photographic career or your journey. We, we know that's a word that you like and I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, what, if, if you look at your journey, what, what you call your journey, I'm going to use journey because you like it. So. <laughs> Where do you, I guess this is kind of sort of leaning onto the same question again, but you know, but I also want, I also want to lean a bit into artistic vision here. Okay. Uh, and 
not sort of focused so much on what we've been talking about already. Um, what is your current artistic vision for yourself? And where do you see yourself on your journey? Where do I see myself on my journey now? Now. And what is your current artistic vision? Where am I now? Well, I've found my truth. I've found what I, what I want to say to the world in terms of what nature means to me, what it could mean to other people. I think I find my ways to articulate those uh, principles of healing, of reconnection, of unity in many ways, but particularly the first being healing. So I've almost, <laughs> and looking back at my whole life, I've almost gathered this thing and, and find my my channel with it now and I'm at that point where I understand that and I'm I'm you know going with it in, in that I find my direction. I think it will follow similar paths in the future. Um, I'm just gonna go backwards actually I'm not gonna talk about the future because you just talked about that so so that's uh, fine. these are great questions because they're really Sorry. getting me to think. No no it's great. You, you, you did. You did say. Uh, you did say. Uh, lay it on. So. Did say what? Lay it on. Say, yeah, lay it on. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, okay, but yes. Yeah. So I, I think particularly over the past two years, I've made work that that means something with with depth. There's there's definitely a portfolio of twenty or thirty photographs that uh, really say something about me, about my life, and, and tell the world what I'm trying to trying to say to it. So I think at the moment I'm amalgamating all of that into many things, one of them being, and I don't mind talking about this now just briefly, but one of them being my first feature length book, which will, you know, streamline everything I've learned so far in my photographic spiritual, my life path, I won't say the word journey, my life path for you. And uh, yeah, I guess I'm, uh, not so much drawing a line under it, but I'm kind of uh, a, a faint, a faint line, saying, you know, okay, here I am. This is me now, speaking because I've taken off these masks that I maybe placed over my face to be accepted by my stepfathers, to be accepted by my peers, to be accepted by society, and now I have that much self-confidence that I'm not particularly bothered about what society thinks of me anymore and actually I'm just showing the world myself through my work and through my writing. So it's actually a very exciting place that I'm in right now artistically. It's also a mystery because I know how quickly this thing can change based upon, you know, I picked the camera up five years ago and my life just went, wee, let's go this way. So there's, there's a mystery around where, you know, the, the future but of course, I'm here in the present, and <laughs> I enjoy where I'm at artistically at the moment. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think I, I think it does. I think it's uh, I think we're all we're all in a different place in, in this this path or journey or, or however, however we want to describe. I'm using. I'm going to convert you. You're going to use convert me. Go on. I think we're all in this different. Yeah. yeah. We're all in different places. Of, on a journey and yeah. you know it, it's great to see you in a place mm -hmm. where you know you are um, you know you've been able to take what's happened in your past and you, you know and all the, the life experiences that you talk about and you know putting them in you know and channeling them into this into this creative outlets sort of this, as this exhibition you know what your book are you talking about um, and I think that's fantastic. I mean, do, do, when, when you say draw a line under, draw a line under this part of it, do you mean leaving? Do you mean leaving parts of your artistic journey behind? Or, or do you mean, or you always going to have those parts of that artistic journey to, to draw on? Well, they'll always be there. They'll always be in the back of my mind. For example, you know, I've kind of got a little bit tired now of reflecting about my childhood. 
and my childhood experiences and maybe I feel like we actually can get, I mean it's great that we do as a society now and as humans we have this tendency to think a little bit deeper about our psychological well-being but I'm also a little bit wary that we can get caught in that trap of constant reflection and constant oh this is because of this and this is because of this and this is because of this and actually okay like I've I've taken that and I've I've healed many wounds inside of myself that I feel like maybe I don't want to be so focused on prying them open anymore and maybe live in in this present moment a little living bit more often, moment. living in the moment and, and not being so drawn on, on those those things. Nature for me is always going to be a place that I go for healing. So those elements are always going to creep into my communications somehow. And at the end of the day, you don't just all of a sudden go and take photos in a different way. I feel like once you've started to see, you know, once you've uncovered your style or your way of seeing and your way of creating, I don't know that it's going to change dramatically there'll be probably little bits along the way but i've kind of got how i see now and i think that will stay with me but yeah the, the philosophical the psychological stuff maybe just a, a slight transition and maybe actually less about me this is what's happened to me my journey my i i'm kind of sick of seeing i in my in my writing and now maybe it's more about the the world other humans, the we, right, right. the we, interconnectedness, and that's a theme that I've started to see, particularly in Huago over there, is this theme of elements combining to appear as a photograph for me, and maybe that's speaking to me in terms of the interconnectedness of all of humanity and nature. So maybe there'll be less about me and I in, in my works in the future. This is an evolution of self, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Isn't it? You know, we, we've, 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 talk, we've, we've talked about you evolving as a person and you accepting who you are and being accepted by society or not being well, we're accepted to the or rejected by society. <laughs> That's why we're right here. And That's the, why we're here, the sitting thing. here, <laughs> this thing, chatting like mates. And, um, but how, how do you feel that photography has helped, your, helped to evolve your psyche, your, your way of being, um, to get you to where you are? Um, how do you feel that has helped you to interact with other, helped you in, not to interact, helped you in the interaction with other, mm. with creators, um, collaborations potentially? Well, as kind of mentioned earlier in, in the recording, I think photography's had the most profound impact on my psychological state. It's allowed me to uncover parts of me that I didn't previously know, maybe even create parts of myself as well. And I think I was always looking for some form of expression when I was young. I actually used to love to sing, I still love to sing, but I, I can't bring myself to sing in front of people unless I really trust them and then I can. And the, the little boy that used to sing would just be so scared of the opinions of, I mentioned my stepfather before, he's very opinionated on creativity and expression and he wouldn't allow any kinds of, this is my first stepfather, second stepfather, also the same. Neither of them really would allow me to express in many ways. So to have this form of expression now is just, it, it's, it's 180 degrees from who I have been my whole life because now I can talk in many ways as who I am and not be afraid and not be ashamed, which is quite a, a big part of the change is that releasing of this feeling of shame and you know what's what's wrong with being a sensitive empathetic Empathic. considerate you know human if anything it's strength i think sensitivity is, is strength and i think at our core i think every human is a sensitive being but i think we've just lost our way and forgotten and sensitivity has been conditioned out of us by society and I wonder where humanity might be if we all came back to that self that still exists inside self, of a self more self aware place exactly and I think leading into your further question about the collaboration with other people 
I feel like the work that I've done, and here I am saying I, 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 but I feel like the work that I've done inside of myself, inside of my heart, inside of my psyche, has therefore allowed other people to come, because everybody's a mirror, right? So when you come to me, and I don't know if this is true, maybe I think you mentioned it once or twice that you've revealed information to me that you wouldn't normally reveal, and I think Mark, you and Mark had a conversation about it, right? Yeah, we did, yeah. And I feel like that's only able when the person you're speaking to is equally, or, you know, has gone to further depths inside of themselves, right? And then maybe it forces another person to reflect and Yeah, I think it, it builds trust in my, in my eyes, you know. I wouldn't have told you something if I didn't trust you, for, yeah. for argument's sake. As, I, as I'm sure, sure it works the other way around as yeah. well. But, you know, by it. You know, I think I think what you're alluding, well, sorry, what, what you know, what we're speaking about here, you know, you opening yourself up makes other people more receptive. Yeah. To 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 Brad and who Brad is. Yeah. The Japanese have a saying. Not not a saying, but they have a philosophy, and it's uh, you know we have three masks as humans, and one mask we only show when we walk out of the door and walk into society. The other mask is who we show to our close friends, close family, and then the other mask is the one that only we see, you know? And when we're sitting alone in a car at night and we've got our music on and we're deep in thought and emotional or whatever you're going through in that moment, or you go to a woodland and you're sure. also showing that side of yourself as well. So I had this thought that if I could just show something of that truer self to people that maybe they'd return the same treatment and then if we go out into the world and all we'll do the same thing, it's like this ripple effect. That maybe we can just make an impact as a collective. And it starts with yourself, right? You know, the, the thought of if you want to change the world, start by changing yourself, yourself and then that knock-on effect. So I think the people that I've been meeting, particularly in the podcast and in other creative projects, uh, little commercial projects here and there that have seen me collaborate with other creative type people, uh, definitely has um, kind of cemented this this idea that you know you attract what you are in the world and just observing my own relationships now completely different to the relationships that I had and I don't mean romantic relationships but everyday relationships sure. friendships professional relationships poles apart from relationships that I've had as a child as a teenager and then as a younger adult as well. So uh, you've been obviously um, done a few solo episodes on yeah. your, your podcast where you've uh, talked very openly about yourself and your uh, your emotions and your thoughts and, and to a certain extent the reasons why you're doing uh, the podcast but you've also had a few guests uh, on there now, uh, myself, Norman McCloskey, uh, Mark Robbins, uh, just to know a couple. Um, do you feel that by talking to them to, on, on your podcast that, and listening to their stories, do you feel that, you know, that those stories are helping to reflect upon your own, on your own events in your life and do, they help, do, do those conversations help sort of yeah. formulate any decisions going forward? Not decisions is not the right word, but formulate any thoughts and processes. Do you feel that by talking to the, the, the guests you've had in your podcast, that they're inspiring your thoughts and they're maybe inspiring your own, you know, inspiring you to look at your personal development yeah. and photography in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. I think the podcast was intended for a number of reasons. Uh, the primary reason was to get to know people behind the works, following the conversation that we had here about art and photography maybe being separate and photographers being lesser, I thought, hang on a minute, let's fight these photographers' corners and introduce people to them and their reasons why. I also feel like it's definitely been a, a, a way that I can grow myself and in doing so I also thought that, you know, upon recognising that I grow by having conversations with people, also I look and think, well, the people watching can also grow. And I actually had a comment on one video. It was the video with Norman. I had a comment a couple of days ago from somebody saying, uh, thank you for you know, doing what you're doing. Uh, 
your, you know, the conversations that you're having are helping me to go and learn about myself and my own reasons and reflect upon things within myself as well. Please keep doing what you're doing. So, yes, it's been brilliant for me and I've been able to go within myself. But I do also know my story very well already, so there are parts that I... So it's understanding other people. It's understanding, understanding other people more so than, you know, understanding my own story. And I also think it can be incredibly cathartic for other people to just have that brain, you know, untangled, like this knot that's in, that's in everybody's heads. And I feel like the trees have really helped to untangle mine. So now it's like giving back and helping to untangle other people, as a therapist would, I guess, I'm just not qualified. <laughs> but yeah, definitely the conversations. Proud car therapy services linked below. Who knows where it's going. Uh, but yeah, you know, I definitely, it's, it's, a, it's a two way, three way kind of thing that's going on here. I'm growing, hopefully you're growing. And, and someone else who watches the video play. or listens on. Yeah, TV. and then, I just really feel like it can make the whole world a better place if we all deepen our understanding of ourself. Mm. And that comes as a, as, a, as a partnership. We're all one, we're all humans at the end of the day. So we're all kind of helping each other to expand our own knowledge and drive forwards and learn and just reflect and grow and be. <laughs> do, you, do you see a little bit of yourself in that? the photographers yeah. and other creators that you've interviewed and spoken yeah. to. Yeah, absolutely. Going back to an early, the earlier part of the conversation where I was talking about I and, you know, we're all, we're all the same thing. We're all human beings that share this space, this space of, in, in, this, in the spiritual world, this conscious energy. We all feel each other's energy. We all empathise with each other, right? So, what was the question? I can't remember. Do you see? Do you see a little yeah. bit of yourself yeah. in all the photographers yeah. that you? That you yeah. So, 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 when I look at other people, and I mentioned before, I'm a very empathetic person, I'm a very observant person. Yeah, I see me in you. I see me in. Eugene, uh, in Mark, I see me in, in Natalie, who I interviewed, there's parts of me, there's parts of my fears, my you know, hopes, everything, and I think it's, we all become like each other when we're together, because we all mirror, whether we're conscious of it or not. Mm. I think, I, I think as well, I, 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 as a conversation point, I think in the, this, this, the current world we live in can quite can feel quite uh, unconnected. But it's very yeah. it's very connected in a way, but it's also very unconnected mm -hmm. in a way where you know people are living their own lives and they sort of you, you, not always interacting with other people. Is so it when you do listen to a podcast such as yours or 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 another photography podcast? I think you realise that you're not you're not alone in yeah. the world. You know, you are. There's other people out there who yeah. just like who just like you and yeah. have similar thoughts, and they sort of have similar yeah. troubles and similar ways of being. And I've 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 been listening to photography podcasts for the last few years, and you can go say through fifty episodes of someone's photography podcast. He's been scratching my nose, um, and think, oh, I recognise that. Uh, yeah. Thought. I recognise that thought, I recognise, oh, I do it that way. Yeah. Or maybe I would like to do it that way. I think that you see what yourself in, a little bit of yourself in everybody. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm glad that you mentioned that part a moment ago about, uh, you know, not being alone and you can go through life thinking that you're the only one who's had things to deal with. That is also another key in these conversations that I'm having as well, because I certainly felt that, especially when I was when I was young and I was going through school and I was going through university and I was comparing my life to everybody else's, thinking these people just don't understand me. They don't understand the things that I've been through. And yeah, you know, episodes of you know domestic abuse and violence are very rare, but everybody's got their own their own interpretation, their own version. 
of what I... Their own baggage. Is their own, yeah, their own baggage, but their own version of what I lived through, even though in my head I thought, oh my God, my, my stuff's really deep and dark. But everybody's got stuff. Everybody's got demons and everybody's felt things in their life that maybe brings them some kind of pain. So to have these kind of conversations, it's liberating. It's so liberating for me to think, oh, yeah, I've got this stuff. Eugene's got this stuff. Mark's got this stuff. So what? We're all out here doing, all doing our thing and it's all led us to this place now where we're actually trying to make something positive out of it. And we're all in this thing together. But every human's the same. And I think there's too much in this world of, oh, let's pretend like everything's okay. Let, you know, let's just hold our shit together and just be like, oh, I'm, I'm all good. No, I don't need to worry about this person who... And I've certainly observed it in my younger adult years where I observed you know, a, a friend, a mate, <laughs> playing down somebody's struggles and almost just turning his nose up at this person and being like, you know, no, I never... I've never had anything like that, that's, yeah, and, and, you know, I'm thinking, I mean, if I was this version of me now, I'd have certainly said something, but at the time I wasn't strong enough to confront and say, hang on, no, you know, that's actually out of order, that, you know, you probably just made this man feel incredibly isolated and alone in his struggles. Mm -hmm. Now I'd put my arm around the lad and be like, yeah, I've got shit, do you want to hear about it? Yeah. Let's talk. I think this is a very, we live in quite a stoic society yeah, you know, without in, doubt. in this country and I think you know, sort of going, going back to the sort of talking to different people on your podcast and I think, I, I think, you, I think you might see this more if you, as, you, as you progress and speak mm. to different people across the world but I, I, I think you'll find that uh, with different cultures and yeah. from, uh, sorry, speaking to people from yeah. di different cultures and different countries and how they they react uh, to they sorry how, how they present themselves and how how they react to their own huh. you know problems or insecurities yeah. or securities for that yeah, matter yeah. and how they react to other people. Um, it, I, I I've lived in a few places across the world and you've lived in a few places across the country and it, 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 even just across a few places in the country it can be different about how people interact with each other and. Um, uh, and, and, and how they respect each other. So, do you feel like in other countries they're more open to talking about and and in and certain situations? Yeah, yeah, I think there's certainly a lot more community around um, people. There's a lot more uh, community around. It, it, this is not everywhere, but I'm just you know in, in certain places. I'm not going to go into too many details yeah, sure. now, but I, I, I've certainly seen communities sort of gather around to help people you know, who are having difficult times a lot more than I have seen it in recent years in this country. And it's not saying this country is a bad place or anything mm -hmm. like that, because, you know, I, I don't think that or I wouldn't live here. Um, but I think, I, d I do think different societies react to, to, to it in different ways. And I think as you get to speak to more people, yeah. you will, you'll see different perspectives yeah. coming in. Um, that, you know, Will help you guide you as a person. Yeah, sure. Yeah, as well. So. Yeah, and guide everybody watching. Guide everyone else watching. So. Tell your friends. <laughs> so we move a little bit away from the emotional side of things. Mm. Um, maybe on to some. What some F number did you shoot this? What F number? So <laughs> did you shoot this at F? Just as we being his eye then, Right. So earlier on, I touched. You know. Uh, I think to start the podcast, I talked about sitting around this room and seeing all your different um, your different photos on the wall. Yeah. And you know, sorry, seeing all your different photos on the wall, and you have your favourites. And I have my favourites. They're going to be quite different, I'm sure. But I guess that's sort of uh, na the nature of art, as yeah. it is. You know, people, <clears throat> people will connect to different pieces as well. So. The question is, what is your perception of your own art as art? Oof. And are you always positive about it? <laughs> or are you very self-critical with this, uh, the evil inner voice? Mm. There's less self-criticism now with my work than there has been in the past. And there's less self-criticism with photography 
as a whole than there has been about the previous Brad who was into bodybuilding and fitness and tracking calories and macronutrients and all of this kind of stuff and that was very obsessive. With photography I'm, I'm less because I've healed many wounds in myself. So there's less perfectionism that's, that's gone into it. Of course there, there are parts of you know, the composition and everything that I feel like you have to be somewhat a perfectionist as a, as a photographer. Yes, I am. Uh, in healthy perfectionism. But I wouldn't say I'd sit there and obsess if something's a little out of focus or a little soft here or there. I don't really care too much. The if the photograph says what I want it to say, then brilliant. So I guess that leads me into how do I see my, how do I perceive my photography as art? Which I feel like this conversation in itself has answered that question in that I feel like it's art. And it, I wouldn't do it if it wasn't giving me an artistic voice and an ability to speak in a deeper way to the world if I was somebody who just took a photograph of, I don't know, Tower of London. And said, here you go. The technically perfect. Technically, look at this and look at the lens that I used. Look how sharp it was. What do you think? Then that just would not fulfill me at all. I'm speaking from within myself and I feel like I'm being used by something, whether you would call that thing God or I don't know, the, the labels, there's something higher that the that, higher being the higher being, divine source, whatever. I think there's something driving this work through me, which naturally makes it uh, I think, I feel. I think. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, that's the answer I was hoping for. So. Right. So, you've, so you've talked about you know you, you, you're not a very technical photographer. You obviously are more guided by emotions. Yeah. However, when you sit here and and and, and look at or review a piece of work or a piece of a, a piece of art for that matter, do do you are you are, are you always positive about that? Are you always positive about that image, or, or, or is your mind going through cycles? Yeah. Are, are you do you, you criticise the art and then... My own. Your own, your own. I'm not talking about other people, I'm talking about your own pictures. Uh, I mean, I, if, if you, say, say for argument's sake, you sat here and looked at this picture behind me. Um, the first dance, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, oh, that's right. And, uh, you know, you, you, you said that. Do, do you go through stages where you're very self-critical of a piece of work like that? Or do you go through... Or are you always seeing it in a positive light, or you, or are you having to fight sort of the the evil in the the evil in, in, a, in any of the work that you see in here? These have all survived. They've stood the test of the evil in a voice that has looked at it and gone, actually, what what is that saying? All of these speak for me, so I wouldn't ever stand here and look at one and and dislike it anymore. And not, not that I should ever say ever because I'm sure there'll come a point where I'll have evolved and I'll look back and think, doesn't quite maybe cut the mustard anymore. But they've all been created from a place of here, of heart, of truth, of soul. So I can't criticize these pieces of work. I can't find it in myself. Not, not anymore. Not, any, not anymore. And I don't think I, I remember criticizing any of these pieces at any point through my journey. Of course, I've looked back at them first dance is 2021 but that's going to live on i think forever because of the personal meaning that it holds to me and it represents an awful lot in terms of sentiment and through the process of editing and uploading and, and reflecting i'm already you know deciding sometimes a photograph will just grow and grow and grow on me sometimes maybe it slips down the hierarchy and uh, and gets lost in the in the archives but um, I feel like sometimes I'll, I'll look at a body of work and it's not like I don't like it anymore because it still has the meaning in in here but I definitely look at work and think it's kind of feeling a little stagnant now maybe it's time to evolve and that's when I'll maybe you know look at my portfolio and maybe go on my Instagram and just kind of look and think it's more frustration than dislike and more frustration than self-criticism anymore because they've been made with love and joy and truth and all of this stuff that I can't hate them or sabotage them. Leading on from that, do you ever 
go back and look at older images in your catalogue and discover something new that yeah. you may not have noticed before. And yeah. maybe, you know, because you've evolved to the place you are now, that photo from five years ago, yeah. all of a sudden is full of meaning. Yeah, I've done that. It means something completely different. To yeah, you. I can't draw any specific examples, but I've definitely been back through, you know, mornings, particularly in in the moments when I'm in my creative lulls and I'm daydreaming about previous adventures that have meant something to me, I'll go back through the catalogue and I'll just discover something and like, you know, it maybe represents a feeling that I'm looking for again, or maybe it's represent a feeling that I'm feeling right now that it didn't mean anything about back then. Uh, because, you know, the subconscious is powerful and it knows what it wants to photograph before this, before I know sometimes what I want to photograph. Sort of why you never delete the old ones. Exactly, yeah, and I don't really ever delete any right. any photographs. I've probably got 50 or 60,000 photographs somewhere. Back from the earliest days when I'd come back with, I don't know, four or five hundred on, off, a, off a day. Now it's more like, four, I don't know. Five. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, how do you how do you deal with lulls and in, in creativity and inspiration? I accept them, like I do with anything. Now it's a case of accepting it when things aren't great. <laughs> you know, nature can teach us a lot about life, can't it? And you know, speaking philosophically now about you know Eastern philosophies of follow and flow and be like water and you know just allow the, these things to pass. I love watching clouds sometimes just just representing, you know, passing. You could be in, on a dark cloudy day, but the clouds pass over and, and light shines again. So it's exactly the same in creativity. And I think actually lulls, creative blocks, dying public periods, whatever, are actually where our greatest growth happens. It's like we're, you know, going like a little chrysalis into our little, you know, hideaway places. And there's truth in it. becomes a normal part of the process, isn't it? Yeah. So you sort of, it's not something to get beat up on, is it? No, and I would have at one, you know, one point in my stay in my journey path, uh, I'd have definitely sat there in these periods thinking, I need to be creating. So and so's out creating. Everybody's out creating. I need to go and create. But it can't happen all the time. Oh. We're not, you know, run on back. We're not robots yet. <laughs> so <laughs> we can't always go 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 and it's just representative of life sometimes we need to sit back and this can go out to anybody entrepreneurs mothers fathers mm. you know anybody doing anything in life sometimes you just got to take your foot off the gas and sit back. and sit back and reflect the key for me in those levels is that I'm still working on my on my art on my vision because I'm reflecting and living <laughs> that's important too right yeah very, very <laughs> to live a life because very life important. goes into these so yeah just yeah you got it don't stress anymore no. and i'm like listen to me i'm saying like i've been at this thing for like 50 years it's five years but oh my god in my head it's been 50 years do you know what i mean it's been a yeah i think when you sort of when you start forcing yourself when you start forcing yourself or forcing an expectation even, that, 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 that sort of, I think it can lead to a negative spiral in, in sort of creativity or image making or, or whatever term you want to put on it. Um, I mean, I, I think we've covered this. We break, we, I wrote the question down, but we briefly alluded to it earlier. You know, is, is what expectation, do you have expectation when you go into, it, into a place to make images? Or are you taking a more reactive sort of experimental approach to mm. to taking a picture or making image yeah. higher, however you want to phrase it? I'd say in recent times I I don't have expectations when I first go because I rarely scout the internet anymore. In my earliest days of photography I'd do some scouting and see what you know, what the place looks like, what's possible, I'd get inspired by other people's work. But now when I go somewhere I don't do any of that because I kind of know what I what I see. I know how I take how I create photographs now. So 
I don't expect anything. The, the expectations come once I've been to a place a few times and I've started the process of, and I've mentioned to you before, I have this process of, of uh, maybe going and, and seeing my photograph before they're there, whereas you create very reactively, right? Right. So sometimes there is a little bit of an expectation that I've created myself based upon I've seen the scene and I, 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 I wonder what it can look like when I go back there. And yes, you I, see the potential in it. Yeah, absolutely. Something will will move me. You know, I'm, I, I keep getting drawn to Troago there because I saw that a few times before I managed to create that yeah, photograph. I've seen that too a few times. And I'm like jealous. <laughs> And yeah, I'd seen that, that babbling brook and the silver birch trees and I, you know, sometimes you just look and think there's, there's something here. And of course, you, as you build up knowledge of the environment, you know where the light's going to be as well, right? So in my mind, I'm already projecting this magical light in snow or rain or, or fog or whatever it is that passes over. And sometimes it pays off and it's actually better than I visualized in that instance, mm. absolutely one of those. So the expectations then from that work seeded. Uh, but I also mentioned before that a few photos in here are more reactive than, than expected or visualized. And I think there's a place in my portfolio, a place in my heart for both approaches. I love going to a, a scene and being in that scene for a long time before I create a photograph. I also love going and seeing the light. I mean, I'd been to this woodland many times before, but I hadn't seen these photographs. So I also love going and and see, observing this light and following it. That approach is also beautiful and it puts me right into the moment as well because there's nothing else going on. Like I said, there's just that childlike wonder. But I do feel in, recent times, I think you mentioned something about experimentation, that's something I haven't been doing for, for quite a while actually, I'd say probably for a year, 18 months, I think since I wrote my book actually and produced that, because that made, it didn't make me, I chose to fall into this idea that okay this is how I take photographs now, so I don't actually want to play too much and I guess thinking about where I may be going with my art in the future. Maybe there'll be a little bit more experimentation and a little bit more childlike wonder and curiosity, which can get lost, I think, when you have this vision and idea of who or what you it's are. It always gets lost in familiarity, doesn't it? Yeah, so, which is, it's difficult, isn't it? Because on one hand, I want to create work that looks like my work and I want it to have artistic merit and be recognisable. On the other hand, I miss being that little boy that picked the camera up and ran outside and just clicked it around at everything and played and 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 just had fun. So there's there's a toss up, isn't there, between you know what do we what do we want? Where do we want it to go? Yeah. Yeah. You've often spoken of a deep connection to woodland. Yeah. But also to Snowdonia. Yes. Um, how's th that environment in particular impacted you? What is it that sort of really attracts you to Snowdonia and mm -hmm. all the landscape there? Or what? Mm -hmm. how, how, how does that affect you? I think, uh, I don't know if, uh, I don't know what it is a lot of the time. It's, it's beyond the place almost, isn't it? Yeah. It's a feeling that exists inside of me whenever I cross the realm and just enter that park. And, you know, I could be this side of the plaque that says Snowdonia, and maybe I wouldn't <laughs> be so, but then I see Snowdonia and I venture over and all of a sudden I'm in Snowdonia. It's almost like this, it's like this feeling, that, this thing that I've created inside of myself, like the, there's you of old, there's you of new, or you know, this, this dreamlike paradise that I've made where it, it's essentially where the, this part of myself was born in that national park. It's almost a safe space, isn't it? Yeah. In way. Yeah, I guess so. It's, and it's, it's been where I first learned to express these things inside of myself. And like you say, it's definitely become something of a safe space, but also this fantasy land that maybe I've been able to be the person that I've always wanted to be when I cross over into that landscape. And 
you know, those, those kinds of feelings, I wonder if there's a past life or something, and, you know, I question those kinds of things all the time. I'm, I'm not strictly any kind of religion, but the idea of past life and this soul that's travelled through many realms and universes to get here, who knows, maybe somewhere deeply I've had a link with Snowdonia, or maybe it's ancestral. I haven't looked too much into a family tree yet, but I do plan to. Maybe there's some ancestry there, but there's just something, and I don't get it anywhere else. You know, I've been to Scotland, I've been to the lakes, I've been abroad, I've been to Iceland, I've been to Poland, and nowhere really can fill that void. I definitely think it's a place that I'm going to end up at, at some point in my journey. I hadn't thought about going there before I went to Aberystwyth, but I worry that if I go there, I'll never leave because, you know, <laughs> it's, it's got the pull. It's got that pull, and it's got that. that it's the place that I go on the weekends when I've worked and I was employed. I'd do my Monday to Friday in, in, in the office and Snowdonia was the place that I'd I'd go to get away from so all escape, that stuff. To escape, escape from sort of certainly the mundane. But... So it became my computer game, if you like. When I was younger, I played computer games and I, I love character, <laughs> I love role player games. And now that gave me the opportunity to be the character in the physical world instead and to go there and create and just have fun and explore so yeah there's a deep 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 connection to that land and it only grows stronger you know with age and with return visits well, i mean i, I see it's in a very similar way to you do it, it, it's a place of escape it's a mm. place of it's like mystery and a lot of folklore, I guess, if you want to call it. And I, and I think that mystery draws people to a place, and it's a place that maybe they can connect with where, excuse me, a place that they can connect with where, you know, you don't have to think about your sort of personal struggles or day-to-day yeah. -day life or feeding the cat or walking the dog yeah. or, or, or whatever you want to do. It's just a place where you can go be, go be you. And, yeah, uh, and you see that a lot in the people who come to Snowdonia mm. as well. You see a lot of people come there to walk and to hike and yeah. climb and boat and uh, do do whatever. And they, I think they're all coming there for a similar yeah. reason. I feel like uh, it definitely but attracts. As soon, as soon, sorry, sorry Go on, no, say, no, as soon as you step over that park boundary, it feels different. Yeah, because I feel different if I take photos near where I live, which is yeah. just outside the park. Yeah, I feel completely different too. It's like, well, I think, why need to study? Yeah, I'm gonna go take photos and see. Yeah, and then of course it comes across when you reflect and you write about these these experiences. Well, like my writing's so different when I'm writing about Snowdonia to anywhere else. There's a lot more. It's in passion. Truth, passion it? just evokes passion. Just the word Snowdonia means something. Or Erari now, but it but it's, it's still Snowdonia to me. And I'm sorry, Welsh <laughs> listeners. It's still. It has to be because it's what I've known for, for five years, but it just invokes that feeling. And I think, like you say, surrounded by the folklore and the stories. I feel like anybody, not anybody, but lots of people who pick up a camera, we're storytellers, right? So we love the idea of these characters who've existed. Yeah. That maybe there's some truth to, you know, giants and wizards. Did Dragons. they really exist in the form that we made them? But there's some truth to who these people were. Jesus, all of these people, there's some truth to them, right? So maybe it allows us to put ourselves in in those and imagine, oh, maybe my story could be told in 2,000 years. Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> and that's just, you know, I think it's extremely I, optimistic. I think when you look at, I think when you look at, uh, just building on what you're saying, sorry, building on what you're saying, I think when you look at sort of the stories that, you, that present itself in a place like Kareri, is is that you can really build those into your photography as well. So if you, you, you know, you can build in sort of, you know, spied rocks yeah. that look like dragons lying in yeah. the landscape for argument's sake. You, you, you can build that in and, and cr create a narrative which gets your, your, your emotions, your imagination going, yeah. and other people's imagination yeah. going. And I think that's quite exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think there's certain places that you'll go, it's not yeah. only a rare for one, but there's plenty of other places yeah. that you can go where they, they may, you may be able to evoke similar emotions. Yeah. It, it just depends what you connect with. And absolutely. You can obviously very clearly connect with what happens in. Snowdonia and everything yeah. that's built around. So. Yeah. There is also a deep connection to Mid Wales as well. But yeah, it's a different connection. Home. Mid Wales is home. Snowdonia is my 
a step of a home. Yeah. <laughs> Spiritual home. Indeed. Right. So we just want a few questions to get to know a little bit about Brad. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe I've only got to know nothing. <laughs> a little bit. Who you inspired by? Not necessarily photography. Who, what, why? What inspires you? Oh. What inspires me? Music. Music. Hugely. Music was my first love I mentioned before that I used to love and still do love singing and I think if I if I were to be anything when I was old when I was older as a child it would have been a singer if I was to pick a creative act out of some. So music definitely inspires me. There's too many bands and acts and musicians to name who. No, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not looking at specifics. So I'm sort of, I was yeah. asking in a, in, a, in a more general sense. Yeah. But particularly music that tells a story, music with some depth and meaning to it. And whether that's the, the story of the artist or the story of the piece of music. I think music sends me on a journey, particularly if I'm out in the, in the car and I'm driving somewhere and I've got a, a piece on that, that sends my visual brain into all kinds of different places and realms. I tend to see rather than read. Somebody told me or had a conversation with me recently that we have two ways of thinking in our minds. We either think in terms of like words and I think it was words and numbers and things, or we think in terms of visions. Visions. Yeah. And, and music inspires me to think visually. Yes. So yeah, music inspires me. My, my family my family inspire me. My mum inspires me, even though I don't tell her. She inspires she's me. She's gonna massively. know that. She's gonna know, yeah. She's probably gonna come and give me a big cuddle and be really soppy when she hears this. But yeah, my mum really inspires me because I know and she knows how hard she's fought to bring us kids up. I'm one of five and you know, we're all on our own little paths and we're all living our lives. So my siblings also inspire me as well. Because we've all been through a lot together and I know the struggles, some of the struggles they face, or if they know some of the struggles I face. Uh, also my girlfriend, as I mentioned my mum and I mentioned my girlfriend as well, who inspires me with who she is and, and the, again struggles and the things that she's lived through and her ability to f face those head on like a charging bull and say I'm not being beaten by anything. I'm the victor, I'm winning this thing. Uh, also, people like yourself, Mark, Norman, or Natalie who approached me last year for, because she wanted to take the step out and become a creative person and take some pictures. All of these people, you know, anyone who's willing and open enough to step out and try something and, and talk about these Issues, all very inspirational, I think. Uh, who else? Who else do I need to name? They, I'd like to thank all my friends. Yeah, I know. No, I think I, I think that I think it's great that you take inspiration from so many different things and people and parts of life and yeah, you know you. And, and meld that into your and, and meld that into your photography yeah. and meld that into your image maybe. Yeah. everything can in, inspire me in some ways because life is in these photos everything I've watched and listened to and yeah I think we touched a lot on that when I talk or yeah, or sorry, I when we talk sorry is, is like there's a little bit of you and or a little bit of us and yeah. there's a little bit of everything in each photo I think is yeah. what I'm trying to say yeah you know, whether it's an yeah. experience that happened when you were five years old or yeah. something you listen to on the, on the radio on the way or in the music in the car on the way to go take a photograph. I think it's all, it's all part of it. Yeah. It all creates the originality that, uh, uh, and the artistry that we see here. Yeah. Know, so. Yeah, there's, yeah, it, you know, there's bits of everyone I've ever met in, in these photos, right? Even the people that I don't like. <laughs> hey, that the broken not the people that I don't like. The broken the people branch. who have negative influences <laughs> on me potentially uh, are still in these as well. Okay, ready? Yeah. So, this is a question from one of the guests. Okay. 
is, is, the, is it the photographer who makes the image? Oh, sorry, I, I should clarify, yeah, that's it. Uh, so, the last few days, um, Brad and I both put out some uh, uh, story on Instagram asking yeah. if anybody had any questions uh, for, 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 the, uh, for the podcast. And one of the questions that came up was, is it the photographer who makes the image or is it the scene that presents itself? I think we've covered this. Yeah. Um, but maybe just okay. talking a bit more specifically. Yeah, so to directly answer that, the I believe that we're creating pieces of art that requires somebody to create. Yeah, so the photographer, of course, creates the image. Yes, nature is already there. And I think I covered a little bit of ground before where I mentioned about being the channel, being, you know, whatever it is that's out there channeling something through me. And I guess being the conduit from whatever it is to the physical three-dimensional world. So yes, there's elements of both, I guess, in that answer where we've got to see it, but it's also got to be there. And maybe we're just, maybe we're just the observers. We're just the people who, the, the, the bodies, the 3D things that react to emotionally. And I'm going to speak from my point of view, of course, because I create emo using my emotions. So maybe I'm just there to react emotionally to whatever's out there. And I think as well, it's, it's, a, it's, your, it, it's, it's the vision or the brains behind the eyes that interpret the scene yeah. that's in front of you to be able to create that image. You know, Absolutely. The scene's always going to be there, but it, yeah. it's up to you to be yeah. able to see it and yeah. present it. Yeah, we've got to give it meaning and we've got to give, give it a storyline. And there's, you know, there's a lot of personal expression in these photographs based on experiences that have happened in my life that have given it a name, for example, and allowed a human to interpret that name. Yeah, definitely. Last question. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah. No, no more from the audience. No. There was one on mine about my favourite image and why. I think, of course, I've got a lot of favourite images, but I actually think probably for what it means personally I mentioned it before that it is I'm going to say it's first dance because that was created after a conversation with my nan end of 2020 boxing day 2020 my nan came and we had dinner with my my mum and my family and I was showing my nan some pictures from Scotland and it was during a time when I was probably more technically obsessed and location obsessed and you know I, I, was, I, I basically showed her a picture of Old Man a Store, huge rock formations that every, everybody's been to see and most photographers have been to photograph, right? So I photographed the store, guilty, right? <laughs> and I showed my nan and and I was like, look at this, man, look at these things, these rocks in Scotland. And, you know, what do you think of it as a, as a photograph kind of thing? She goes, don't you see the faces in the rocks? I was like, nah, what the hell are you talking about? She goes, there, look, zoom in. She goes, zoom in. And I did, I zoomed in. I was like, I can't see them. She pointed to right there, and I started to see as she was explaining where it was, two eyes and a... Right. And she's there in a knitted jumper and like a bit of food spilt behind this jumper. And I'm looking at my nan, just thinking, oh, yeah. what a cutie. Like, she's in her head, she's in her imagination, isn't she? It's, a, it's the imagination. And she goes, she goes, move over, there's another one. There's a man and a woman there. I was like, okay, All right, okay. yeah, whatever you say. But then I, I moved the screen over and I started to see another face in the, in the rocks. And I kind of took a look at myself in that moment and not maybe in the moment, but upon reflection after the moment, thinking, she, she raised some questions in my head. I'm thinking, my, my style of doing photography is really quite boring, isn't it? Like, here's some rocks, and this is the, the place and the settings that I was using. I thought, this, this lady, and she's in a home now, she's, she's got dementia, and she's, she's deteriorating, and... I thought this woman, and, and she, knew, she knew at the time she wasn't in the best place, so you know, she started to reconnect with her 
child again, her inner child, and she's living in this place of imagination. And I think, okay, so, so two ends of life. We, we live in this state of play and wonder and imagination. What the hell is this here? Where we're so the in between. focused. What is the in-between? We're so focused on this nonsense, really. You know, n you know you, n numbers, money, friend, peer, opinions, <clears throat> technical settings on a camera, <laughs> you know, to, to compare them. And I'm thinking, I'm so, I'm, I'm so lost. What happened to this boy, this child who would read stories and use his imagination? I'm that, I was that then and I'm going to be that at the end of my life. So why am I waiting all of that time to have fun and explore and experiment and play and imagine and be in wonder? And that year just changed me really. And I produced probably 10 or 15 photographs that I was just invoking imagination and wonder and I was visioning trees dancing and actually kind of representative of what I imagine my nan and granddad's relationship to be like where it, they're kind of waltzing through this light and I always used to remember, I have very fond memories of my nan and granddad. I observed a happy functional couple and my home life didn't really portray that to me because I saw dysfunctional family or related parental relationships. So I have this fondness of that photograph for, for that reason really, that it represents my nan and granddad. But also it stands to represent this, I guess, journey back to the inner child and the healing journey that that sent me on to imagine and create with imagination again and to, yeah, just, just take that little boy by the hand and kind of just allow him to express again. So, yeah, first dance for me, although. Yeah, it's also, it's also an anthropomorphization of nature, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's sort of relating it to sort of the human, human condition and the human psyche. Yeah. So. So yeah. I find fascinating. So, yeah. so it's one of my favourite images. Mean, really? Yeah. yeah. It always has been. Oh, so. I didn't know that that was. Yeah. I thought... You know, there's, there's that one and there's another one in the book which I can't Yeah, I know the one in like Encha the Enchanted Woodland. Yeah, I think yeah. 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 Where I wrote about Alexis French, Bluebird, yeah, that's the one. piece of music <laughs> alongside it that I'd <laughs> imagined the, these trees just in this harmonic kind of dance. And yeah, when you, when you watch them in the wind, that's exactly what trees are doing. They're kind of dancing. And, I think, yeah, representation of ourselves in nature there as well. Last question. So, for photographer. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. If you had to not do photography for a month, yeah. what would you do? What, what, what else makes you tick? Writing. I'd write. And I'd probably probably just sit in the woodland <laughs> like I did, I think I went Take yesterday. Away. Yeah, just sit there. There was a, a tree had fallen down in a local woodland and I went and I just, I just sat on it and I just faced the, 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 this kind of hill, this hilly slope with silver birch and fallen leaves and I just faced it and I just tuned into the sounds of every single raindrop like this all around me, and with every drop it was just like this thud of a drum, like nature calling me home and just being like, you know, be here, be here, be here, be here. And I just sat there, probably for 15, 20 minutes. So I'd probably fill my time with that, being, and of course writing maybe some poems or, or singing. That's it, singing? Or I'd eat. <laughs> Eating's <laughs> lost food, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, well, don't we all fill it with creativity? That's a pretty great way to end the podcast. <laughs> yeah, because I have food because I'm, I'm starving. Well, so <laughs> maybe we'll go and get some food well, together. Well, I just lastly, yeah, I just like to say thanks very much for allowing me to interview you. I think that is very brave of you, <laughs> and you know, to open up with all the things you've opened up. <coughs> Excuse me, to open up with all the things you've opened up with, you know, and, you know, answer all the questions I have so eloquently. I really, I, I think it's great. I think Thank it's you. great that you can sit here on your own podcast and tell people <laughs> about yourself. I think yeah. it's fantastic. So, yeah, I um, kind of feel like the, the whole thing's been leading me to this point where I feel capable of speaking and opening up because, 
yeah, I hid for a long time and it didn't really do me any favours with my own sense of self. So yeah, that's great. Thank you for coming on and being willing to interview me and for doing a brilliant job, by the way. Really Few stars. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, we're very good. <laughs> well, so they didn't mind. Well, no, there were some yeah, really interesting questions there, so Thanks. appreciate your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay, and there we have it. Ladies and gents, thank you very much for tuning in to this latest episode of Finding Light with me, Brad Carr, of me being interviewed by Eugene Tehran. I'd just like to say a big thank you to Eugene for being willing to come on and grill me with some very interesting and uh, thought-provoking questions. I hope that our conversation has maybe inspired some deeper thought within yourself about your own reasons for either creating or for getting outdoors into nature from a personal standpoint i think we owe it to the world to share our thoughts and our own stories because nature in my opinion is well it's of course helping me a great deal in terms of you know finding myself finding my own soul if you like and i think that a lot of people can benefit from our messages and uh, yeah if it's inspired you to share your own story then please do let me know and uh, maybe we can engage in some conversation so my message box is always open i try my best to re return comment and messages to everybody uh, sometimes some sometimes some slip through the net god that was hard uh, but yeah i tried to get back to everybody so don't be afraid to get in touch with me and until next time uh, i'll say goodbye the next conversation is uh, with a very talented young photographer called murray livingston and I plan to bring that to you in a week's time. He also came along to the old bell where we sat and recorded uh, and had a in very intriguing and in-depth conversation. So, yeah, for now, I'll say goodbye. <laughs>